Hi, good afternoon, everyone. We'll get started in just a minute. Okay, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Harpreet Paul, and I am the Academic Chair of Pediatrics at Hackensack Meridian School of Medicine and Kehovnanian Children's Hospital at Jersey Shore University Medical Center. Thank you so much for attending our seminar today. I also want to take uh, a minute to thank our partners, the NJAAP. We have an amazing topic today. It's gonna be an incredible event. And the speakers that you're gonna hear from today are the top neurologists and physiatrists that you're gonna be able to find anywhere. They're gonna be hosting a discussion related to all aspects of concussion. Um, topics such as prevention strategies, testing, rehab, and cutting edge research. Special thanks to our speakers, Dr. Felicia Glixman and uh, Dr. Nicole Marcantuono. Dr. Glixman is a child neurologist, and she is also the director of Pediatric and Adult Concussion Center at Joseph M. Sanzari Children's Hospital. Dr. Nicole Marcantuono is division chief of pediatric physiatry at Kehovnadian Children's Hospital. I um, want to thank all of you for taking time out of your busy day to attend uh, today. And uh, just remember that the recording today is going to be sent to all of you after the presentation I know our speakers will also keep a little bit of time at the end, around 15 minutes related to uh, questions. So please go ahead and use the chat function uh, for any questions that you, you may have. You're gonna be in for an exceptional treat. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn this over to Dr. Nicole Marcantuono. Thank you so much, Dr. Paul, and thank you all for joining us today. Um, we're very excited to talk to you all about something near and dear to both of our hearts, um, and that is concussion. Uh, next slide. A couple things that we want to make sure we review with you today are just some basic statistics of concussion and traumatic brain injury in the U.S., We'll briefly review the biomechanics of a concussion, how it actually occurs within the brain. Um, we want to make sure that everyone here is able to identify the signs and symptoms of concussion and how to effectively diagnose a child or adolescent with concussion. We'll briefly review a sideline evaluation for sports-related concussions. We will learn about the treatment and management of concussions and briefly review some common misconceptions about treatment. I uh, just want to point out before we go on that should any questions come up, we just ask that you use the question and answer um, function on Zoom. Uh, occasionally we may open the chat box as well, but we will let you know when that opens. Next slide. First and foremost, it is important to point out that a concussion is known as a mild traumatic brain injury. So the CDC made a push in recent years to use the term uncomplicated mild traumatic brain injury to describe a concussion, to differentiate it from a complicated mild traumatic brain injury where you will see findings on neuroimaging studies. Uh, concussion itself is a syndrome of altered brain function, so it's important to note that it is more of a functional injury and much less so a structural injury to the brain. So we should expect that uh, basic neuroimaging studies like CAT scans should be completely normal. Uh, concussion obviously can be caused by a blow to the head. However, you do not directly need to hit the head if there is a strong enough force to the body. That force can get transmitted upwards and cause that brain to shake um, and twist inside the skull, causing that injury. 
One important caveat is that you do not need to have a loss of consciousness to make the diagnosis of concussion. In fact, most concussions will not have associated loss of consciousness. Um, a CT scan should be normal, as I mentioned before. Therefore, having a normal CT scan does not mean that the individual does not have a concussion. Next slide. So um, moving on to some statistics. So um, the most recent uh, from uh, the CDC information was collected from 2006 to 2014. So in 2014, there were almost 3 million TBI related emergency department visits, hospitalizations and deaths within the United States. And um, 837,000 of those were among children. Um, TBI was diagnosed in approximately 288,000 hospitalizations, which included over 23,000 children. Um, and that was either with TBI alone or um, in combination with other injuries. And these mild um, TBIs, which include the concussions, account for about 75% of the traumatic brain injuries that occur each year. And what we do see is that children ages zero to four and the older adolescents from five to uh, 15 to 19 years, and then the older adults 65 and older are most likely to sustain a TBI. Um, and what some of the data shows is that, you know, that zero to four um, age range is, you know, mostly, um, you know, accidental trips and falls, but to include um, those um, also non-accidental traumas. And those older adolescents, we tend to see those are our um, ADHD kids at more risk-taking behaviors um, during those years, and obviously the older population um, that are more likely to sustain um, falls. So the CDC and prevention estimates that about 300,000 concussions are sustained during sports-related activity in the United States, and more than 62,000 concussions are sustained each year in high school contact sports. And, you know, we are seeing an increased incidence of sports related concussion, and this is due to the increased number of our young athletes, but also due to the increased awareness and reporting of concussions, um, as you know, we're doing today with helping to um, increase that awareness. Uh, what is also seen, though, again, while we're here today is that there is variability in uh, care provider experience and training, as well as the explosion of, of all these reports and studies for sports um, concussion and mild TBI, that has led to the uncertainty and inconsistency in reporting and the management of these injuries. Um, I, sorry, I'm going the wrong way, so I'm sorry. So um, overall though, um, an estimated 20% of all adolescents will sustain a concussion. And just to put that number into perspective, there's 43 million adolescents in the US in 2021. So that's such a high number that, you know, again, something that um, pediatricians, school nurses, um, ED physicians, everyone's going to, um, you know, definitely see, see an adolescent at some point with for this reason. So how are these kids getting concussions? Um, a majority um, of sports related, uh, sorry about the typo. So the majority of the sports um, injuries in these kids um, are, are greater than five years of age, um, but approximately 30% were not sports related and that not sports related injuries were higher in the younger ages. So how do we know if it's a concussion or just a simple bump to the head? I think the most important thing to realize is that most symptoms of concussion will begin within minutes or a few hours after the head trauma. There occasionally can be a slight delay in that it takes several hours for concussion symptoms to fully involve. However, typically you will see uh, symptoms or signs of concussion within those first few minutes. One of the most common symptoms that we see is certainly headache. Um, however, a headache is not necessary to make the diagnosis of concussion. Um, in fact, there may be upwards of like at least 15 to 20 percent of people that don't actually experience significant headaches following a concussion. Um, other things that we commonly see are dizziness, um, 
some balance or difficulty with coordination, brief visual changes, as well as nausea. Next slide. Um, the symptoms that we see tend to persist after the first day or so. Uh, most common things are persistent headaches, feelings of lightheadedness or dizziness, uh, poor attention and concentration. Certainly as children are returning to school, we notice more of that uh, memory difficulty. Uh, children tend to be uh, irritable, have a very low frustration tolerance. So we will see mood changes start to come out as a result of that. These kids tend to fatigue very easily. Um, and that's more of a cognitive fatigue. It's not as much of the physical uh, fatigue that we see early on because these children aren't participating in those sports or physical activities initially. Um, very common to see light and noise sensitivities. And with all of these lingering symptoms, it's important that we identify them so that we can manage these patients moving forward as they transition back into their daily and school activities. Next slide. So, um, you know, what exactly is a concussion? Why are these um, disturbances happening, causing these symptoms? So we do understand and, you know, what we're seeing is that this is actually a functional disturbance and not a structural, uh, structural injury that Dr. Marco, uh, Mark Antoine uh, mentioned earlier. So what happens is that you have the sudden movement or a force that happens to the head that causes the brain to shift within the skull. And then additional injury can occur as the brain strikes the skull. This is a very busy slide, but it's really to show you all the busy stuff that's actually happening um, when there is a head injury. Um, and so there's microscopic axonal injury, which is the stretching or the swelling of the nerve itself. And then you get disruption of how the neurofilaments are organized and um, you have um, a difficulty um, with all the processes going down from the cell body down to the axon and meeting the, you know, the, the, the nerve on the other side. So um, what's also seen is that there's decreased cerebral blood flow transiently that can cause these symptoms as well as mitochondrial dysfunction. So increased um, um, oxygen demand and as well as increased energy demand at the same time of a decreased supply of energy that is seen um, throughout all of this, again, this huge neurometabolic cascade that, that's occurring when, um, when a nerve is injured. So, um, you know, what we see is um, a peak of dysfunction right at the onset of the injury, and then it's going to take time for resolution. Um, and then what happens if there is a second repeated injury before the initial injury has resolved, we can see possibly a prolonged introduction of these symptoms, but with increased dysfunction and even longer time to resolution. And, um, you know, what they also see is, um, you know, what risk factors are associated with these prolonged recovery. We always want to make sure we ask about prolonged, uh, prior brain injury, um, if there's any premorbid uh, symptoms such as pre-existing headaches, any um, um, POTS, so postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome or um, orthostasis, as well as, you know, pre-existing AMPS, which is um, amplified musculoskeletal um, symptoms as well. So uh, pain symptoms. And so these can definitely be exacerbated if they're um, pre-existing, um, as well as uh, premorbid mood dif difficulties like anxiety or depression, if there's ongoing psychosocial stressors, as well as um, younger children. In our uh, athletes, there are several standardized assessments that uh, athletic trainers and sometimes even coaches can use on the field when we are talking about uh, sports-related concussions. The most common one used is the SCAT or the Sport Concussion Assessment Tool. We are currently up to the sixth version um, at this point in time, um, but a lot of folks are still using the SCAT-5. Um, it is 
both an on the sideline and off the field assessment that is done by the athletic trainer. It needs to take at least 10 minutes. If done in less than the 10 minute time frame, uh, it can lead to inaccuracies in making the appropriate judgment calls for these patients. So there are 22 uh, different symptoms on this checklist. So those represent all of the symptoms that we can see reported following a concussion. It also has an assessment of cognition, including uh, delayed recall, some manipulation of digits, um, stating you know months of the year backwards. It, includes a brief um, neurologic exam. It includes the BEST, which is the balance error scoring system, uh, as well as a coordination assessment. And then finally, a professional opinion to make that call. Uh, other assessments that are sometimes used are the standardized assessment of concussion or the SAC, um, certainly a brief symptom assessment. Uh, we already touched on the BEST. Uh, as well as evaluations of clinical reaction times, uh, looking at gait and balance, as well as the oculomotor screening. Next slide. Uh, in the office, we also have various tools that can be utilized. So we pay attention to the patient's symptoms and the progression of those symptoms and recovery over time. A lot of the uh, schools and pediatricians' offices are using the ACE, the Acute Concussion Evaluation, and that can be found on the CDC website. Uh, evaluations include a full neurologic exam, including a balance evaluation and a visual ocular motor screening assessment. We also do uh, several cognitive assessments, both uh, verbal assessments, um, recall of information. We can do something called uh, impact testing, which is a computerized uh, neurocognitive assessment that is standardized based on age. So you can get an idea of the person's visual memory, verbal memory, as well as their visual motor speed and reaction time compared to other um, children or adults their age to get a gauge. This is best utilized when the individual has a baseline, meaning that they took this test prior to sustaining the concussion. So you can actually um, compare the individual to themselves pre and post injury and gauge when that thinking um, seems to be fully back to normal. We tend to use this in combination with uh, school performance as well. And when we cannot utilize impact testing or if a child has uh, pre-existing difficulties like a learning disability or uh, significant untreated ADD, um, we also ask our neuropsychology colleagues to get involved and help us with determining when that thinking is back to normal, as well as helping to ensure we have all of the right accommodations in school to allow them to be successful as they are recovering. Next slide. Um, one of the more common things that we hear all the time, um, especially when a parent is calling the pediatrician after hours about a head injury is when should I send the child to the emergency room versus what can wait until the next day? Um, typical red flags of concussion, certainly if their GCS is less than 14, um, if they have any evidence of skull fracture, you know, including uh, battle signs, bruising behind the ear, underneath the eyes, those raccoon eyes, we would want to send them in. Any severe headache or specifically a progressively worsening headache if the person is at rest um, should be evaluated. Any unusual behavior, significant confusion, um, certainly any seizure activity or lethargy would be reasons for evaluation. Um, should we see any focality to a neuro exam? 
if they have an unsteady gait, just you know, walking down the hall or around their house, certainly any ataxia. Um, vomiting once or twice is okay, but if they're persistently vomiting, those would be reasons that they should be evaluated acutely um, and possibly have a CT scan to look for a bleed. Next slide. Um, the PCARN algorithm is a criteria that are utilized in the pediatric emergency departments to determine whether or not a child is at high risk for having an abnormality on the CT scan. Um, we're not going to go through this in great detail. I'm sure if there are any emergency uh, providers on, they are very familiar with this algorithm already. But this is really, the slide is really just to demonstrate that much of the time a CT scan would not be recommended and to just briefly review when it would be uh, recommended. So a lot of times too, if a child's in the emergency department, sometimes we're caught in between, do we just observe them for six hours or do that CAT scan? Sometimes a provider may leave it up to the parent, which one to do, um, but you guys will have access to this algorithm for your review after the talk as well. Next slide. All right, so um, you know, moving on to the typical, air quote, typical concussion management. So what should you do if um, you suspect your patient has a concussion? So important is rest. And really, it's the recommendation is 24 to 48 hours of brain rest. That doesn't necessarily mean bed rest. Um, but it should be followed by gradual reintroduction of daily activities, followed by any uh, non-contact physical activity. Um, we do recommend treating the symptoms, um, you know, whether they be headaches. Um, in regards to the headaches, you know, if they are starting to begin the gradual reintroduction to school, we actually don't recommend um, taking Advil or Tylenol at the beginning of the morning before they go to school to prevent the headaches, because we really need to know what is um, triggering their headaches and worsening it. So it shouldn't be used as a prophylactic, but it should be used to treat the headaches. Um, we want to uh, be mindful of any mood difficulties that may need treated, any sleep disturbances, um, cognitive disturbances, or any disturbances uh, with the vestibulo um, ocular system. We may recommend school accommodations. So um, if, if they're having photosensitivity, reducing um, use of screens, um, um, recommending blue light blocking glasses, uh, they may need to have a reduced school day, um, or if they are able to attend, getting rest breaks throughout the day, um, recommending a reduced workload. Usually what I tell families is, you know, um, when there is a request for this reduced workload is to speaking with the teachers and their guidance counselors that then there's not that expectation to make up what was missed from that <laughs> reduced workload because that adds added stress and anxiety. Um, and can worsen the symptoms also, um, which also goes along with the limited testing. If they do need to have limited testing, um, making sure that there is a plan for an unstressful uh, test um, environment when they do need to take um, the test over. Um, again, uh, use of sunglasses if needed, or if there needs to be some earplugs, uh, they may need, uh, you may want to recommend them leaving the classroom early to go through the school, uh, to, to avoid the quarters with all the kids in there, or to get to their next room before the bell goes off. Uh, we also recommend what we call sub-maximal exercise program, an aerobic exercise program. Um, and with this, they may need um, physical therapy and using the physical therapist as their guide on how to um, advance that progression. And then eventually sports, um, when uh, we will discuss, you know, the appropriate time for, to returning to sports with the progressive return to play protocol, but this is going to be important that the um, that the patient has no symptoms and they have um, they're back to normal school and neurocognitive performance and they have a normal exam including balance um, and the visual visual oculomotor system as well as they're not being treated um, for headaches so they're off medications. So typical recovery in children. Half, half of our patients recover in about two to three weeks. 
Another big majority, 80%, have, have recovered by four to six weeks, and usually 90 to 95% have recovered within eight to 12 weeks. Um, but with all concussions, which is including adults, majority have resolved way, you know, in that shorter period within 10 to 14 days. And I think it's important to um, tell this to patients, um, depending on, you know, when they do present to your office, sometimes, you know, we get them in right away, or they're seen right away, or they're, um, you know, sent a few weeks down the line. And so, um, you know, setting up that expectation is, is important. Um, but, um, you know, expressing that shared decision making and the buy in from the patient as well is going to be important um, for a speedier recovery. What we also want to make sure that we do address is that, um, you know, the um, a lot of times we see a lot of adolescents right off the bat, the adolescents aren't really eating breakfast, but I tell them that that's going to be even more important now as the brain continues to heal. So we want to make sure that they have good nutrition, eating breakfast, lunch, and dinner, good hydration, um, avoiding those impact activities, avoiding any symptom exacerbation, um, again, dressing mood the school accommodations, the co relative cognitive rest, and improving sleep. So my patients always laugh at me when I get to the question, you know, what time do you go to bed, but what time do you fall asleep, and what time do you wake up is really important. And then what, you know, these students who have concussions, they may come home and, you know, need a nap, and then they're going, they can't sleep at night. And so it's really important to just tell them short nap when you get home, you know, 20, 30 minute power nap, but you need to try to stay on a regular sleep schedule. So that way you aren't tired um, when you try to go to school the next day. So really, um, you know, discussing that sleep cycle with, the, um, with the, your patients is really important. From a prognosis standpoint, again, um, the CDC um, uh, found that these factors were associated with poor prognosis. So things to take into account is that older age range, um, Hispanic ethnicity, lower socioeconomic statuses, if they've had a history of intracranial injuries in the past, if they've had um, any premorbid history of mild T, uh, TBI or increased pre-injury symptoms, as we had discussed, headaches, mood disturbances, um, if they have an underlying neurological or psychiatric disorder, if there is any learning dif difficulty or intellectual disabilities already, and if there are uh, family and social stressors. So again, really important to um, address those at the initial encounter um, as they can um, correlate with the poor prognosis. So um, there, I, there's the motto, return to learn before return to play. Again, something else that I do tell my patients, because the first question is, when can I go back to play um, after I filled out their school accommodation form? <laughs> so um, it's important to not allow to return to game or practice if suspected or they diagnosed a concussion on the day of injury. We need to wait at least a minimum 24 hours. Um, they um, are not allowed to return to play until they're asymptomatic, at rest, and off medications. So they can't be on any headache prophylactic uh, medications that we may prescribe or um, sleep supplements. Um, and, you know, you have to make sure that they are completely asymptomatic. I tell them that, you know, there's not a defined set time frame, but they need to be symptom-free at minimum that, that week. Um, as well as off that medications. And um, we review the progressive stepwise approach to return to play and again, return to school first. In New Jersey, since um, we're talking to New Jerseyans, um, um, a student athlete who sustains a concussion or other head injury is ineligible to return to competition or practice until he or she returns to regular school activities and is no longer experiencing symptoms of the injury when conducting those activities. So this is actually part of New Jersey legislation. I tell families that I'm not doing this to be the mean old doctor. We're here to um, you know, protect our, our student athletes and um, our patients, and um, you know, we need to make sure that they're safe to return. And moving on to prevention, um, 
we uh, you know, want to teach that athletes, it's not smart to play with a concussion. Schools and teams um, should have a concussion contract. Uh, state legislation and prevention programs are in place in order um, to help educate the coaches, the athletes, the parents. Um, and, you know, we really do ask that the parents do participate in these programs because there's so many different eyes on the field. And, um, you know, if a, if a parent or, you know, other spectator sees somebody get hit and nobody sees them fall and get up and, you know, hold on to their head and, you know, walk on steadily or try to shake it off. We all need to be advocating just, you know, let somebody know that perhaps they need to pull that player and, and assess them and make sure that they're okay. But this should go, go also, um, uh, um, the athlete should, should advocate for this as well, as well as the coaches. And also very important to just even monitoring the health of these athletes, making sure, you know, that they are conditioned and, you know, well enough to even uh, go out onto the field and play. So we're gonna move on to case review. Um, Dr. Mark Antoana is going to take over. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So we are hoping to uh, engage you guys a little bit more at this point. We're gonna go over uh, two cases and just ask kind of your opinion on what you would do in your office as well or when assessing them you know, at school or sideline. Um, so our first case study is Lucy. She is a 17 year old who is a junior. She is very driven. You get straight A's, uh, very involved at school. She's a member of the National Honor Society choir and yearbook committee. She's also on the varsity soccer team, the basketball team runs track. So she's a year round uh, athlete as well. Um, pretty typical um, social history. She lives at home with both of her parents, two sisters. They have a dog uh, as well. She, as we mentioned, she's a very good student, but her parents have uh, gotten her a tutor for the upcoming PSATs and are already starting to look at colleges. Next slide. So this morning, uh, Lucy was at school heading to her calculus class and she uh, accidentally got elbowed in the head by another student while walking down the hallway. Uh, in turn, this caused her to lose her balance and fall backwards, striking the back of her head against the locker. Uh, right away, she noticed a mild headache and dizziness. Her friends that were with her said she seemed a little bit dazed for a couple seconds. Um, she definitely didn't vomit or lose consciousness, but her friend took her down to the nurse's office to be checked out. When the nurse heard about what happened, she recommended that Lucy be evaluated by her pediatrician. Next slide. So if we can just kind of open a polar chat here. Um, she shows up in the pediatrician's office. She lets them know what happened, um, that she has a mild headache and feels dazed. So at this point, would you all suspect a concussion? Okay, I think we should have enough people that voted by now. Can we close that up and see, are we able to see our results there? Perfect. So 99% <laughs> of people said yes, we would suspect a concussion and Dr. Glixman and I both agree <laughs> with you there. Definitely sounds like it. She has the mechanism of the injury happening. She had that direct hit to her head, those immediate uh, symptoms and signs of a concussion. So the important thing is when she's in your office that you're getting a good history. Um, like we mentioned, you're asking what happened. Did she have any sort of alteration in her mental status? Um, if she did lose consciousness, how long was it? Was it just a couple seconds or was she out for five or 10 minutes before coming to? Um, certainly there are many symptoms that can support that diagnosis, just as Lucy had the headache and dizziness. Um, 
you may also hear about um, ringing in the ears or even a brief like muting of hearing, uh, vision changes, nausea, vomiting. The important thing to also find out are, has she ever had any concussions before? Um, if this isn't her first concussion, it certainly may take longer to recover from it. And we know that with each subsequent concussion you get, though we are expecting full recovery in between, that it becomes a lot easier to get that next one. So it takes slightly less force to give a concussion um, with a direct impact to the head. Uh, we also know that once you have three concussions, we take a bigger jump in risk to that fourth concussion and what we are. And that's why there are folks um, in the country that manage concussions that will say, you know, if you have three concussions, we don't want you going back. Or you'll hear uh, athletes say, oh, don't tell them you had your third concussion because they won't let you play anymore. Um, and while there definitely is um, risk to that, there are other factors that may help us to decide should this teenager or child go back to playing the sport that they've had three concussions in, or do we really need to recommend that they pull and they look towards those much lower risk uh, sports activities. Um, other things that are important to note on history, is there any history of uh, mood disorder or other mental illnesses? Are they currently ill um, or have any other chronic diseases that may play a role in what their recovery patterns look like, and also certainly considering any alcohol or substance use. Um, certainly, were they under the influence of anything at the time of their injury, but also making sure to review with them that while they are recovering, it is even more important that they do not use these substances because they will be much more affected by it while that brain is healing. Next slide. So when evaluating the child in the office, you kind of want to do your general exam. Do they look otherwise well? Do you see any outward signs of trauma, any bruising, bumps to the head? Um, certainly you should feel their head around where they were injured. Make sure we're not feeling any step offs or other signs that there may be a skull fracture there. Um, checking their cognitive status, even briefly in just conversation. Are they alert and oriented? Do they seem confused? Are they repeating things? Um, you want to do a motor exam. Are they moving all their extremities equally? Um, does their strength look symmetric side to side? Are you seeing any weakness on their exam? Um, certainly, you know, are you seeing any abnormalities in their reflexes or their sensation on sensory testing? Um, looking at the cranial nerves, making sure that the eye movements are intact, that the pupils are responding appropriately to light, uh, that the face looks symmetric. Um, we mentioned that we utilize the VOMS, and I know someone had asked oh, what that is or for us to expand on that. So that is our visual ocular motor response. It consists of several eye movements, um, not only performing the movements, but also asking the patient if they experience any symptoms while doing it. So that would include uh, smooth pursuits, vertical and horizontal saccades, our vestibulo-ocular reflex, both horizontal and vertical, um, optokinetic response, uh, as well as convergence uh, testing. We're also making sure we do a balance assessment, looking at just their gait, how are they walking, um, and checking their balance. We typically will check uh, several balance measures. We will check the Romberg, so standing with feet together, um, closing eyes doing a single leg stance with eyes open and closed, uh, as well as a tandem stance and tandem gait as well. Next slide. 
Um, here we just wanted to point out that on the CDC uh, website, there is a lot of good information on concussion, how to treat them, uh, as well as uh, various uh, screening tools uh, available that you can utilize in your office as well. Next slide. Coming back to Lucy again, as all of you agreed, a concussion is very likely. Um, Lucy came to school, was feeling well. She had uh, no history of any uh, risk factors for prolonged injury or prolonged recovery, I'm sorry, or anything else that could explain her symptoms. Um, the timeline of head trauma preceding symptoms definitely fits the bill and she had those common symptoms to support her diagnosis. Next slide. So what management would you recommend at this mm -hmm. point? So we're just going to open up the chat very briefly, just throw in some answers and I'll read them off. I see rest, treat the symptoms, school accommodation, rest, limit screens, brain rest 24, 48 hours, no sports, Tylenol, modifications in school, no gym sports, limited time frame. Uh, ooh, everyone's typing so fast. Inform <laughs> teachers, yes, absolutely. That's until headache <laughs> resolves, breaks as needed, let the teachers know, return to learn before return to play. Wonderful. It sounds like everybody's been um, listening yeah. very well. So briefly agree with all of you guys. Limit that screen time, including phone. Um, I tell my kids, you know, typically for most people, a little bit of TV is okay, um, particularly those shows where you really don't have to pay attention, you know, cooking networks, <laughs> sitcoms, things where if you walk away from a, a 30 minute show for 15 minutes, you can still understand what's going on. Um, but we definitely want to stay off the Instagrams and the TikToks and Facebooks and constantly going back and forth with our friends chatting. Oh, I'm seeing some nice other good answers, a temporary 504 plan in there. So typically if a patient is still pretty symptomatic, like we mentioned, you want to rest them for at least a day, maybe two at the most. Um, I always make sure to tell my patients like, we never really want to brain rest more than a week at the absolute most. Like we don't want them missing more time from school than that. But typically we would recommend just a day or two and then gradually transitioning them back. Um, definitely making sure we have lots of accommodations in place, like some of you are mentioning here in the chat, limiting screen time. So printing out work for them, um, using enlarged font. Um, on any reading assignments, um, sometimes limiting the school day or having rest breaks in there, possibly a 504 plan. Um, someone mentioned uh, sending them to physical therapy. And while there is definitely very good literature for uh, early submaximal uh, aerobic activity to help speed up recovery, um, there are many kids that are pretty mild, straightforward concussions that won't need that. But certainly if you felt that they should be sent right away, that would be great. I would say if you're referring them to PT right away, you might also want to think about sending them to the concussion specialist right away as well. Um, next slide. Oh, are we going to, we have another poll, I think. For this one. So um, Lucy's headache worsens overnight. She vomits once and seems more irritable. Uh, she's brought back to her pediatrician for that follow up visit. When assessed, her neuro exam is normal. So what should we recommend now? Should she stay home to rest, go to school, go to the emergency room or be referred to a concussion specialist as an outpatient?
All right, we'll give you a couple more seconds if you haven't answered yet. All right, let's close the poll. Good. Okay. So I think we're kind of split. Most people are saying center to a specialist. Some are saying go to the emergency room. Some saying go home to rest. Um, I think that all answers can be correct, actually, in this case, depending on the situation. So certainly if she was home resting, not doing anything, and the headache acutely worsened and she vomited and seemed more irritable, we would be concerned that there might be an epidural bleed uh, going on or some other bleed that we should scan her for. But if you find out that um, right before these symptoms started, she was you know, running around with her friends through the mall um, on a weekend. And that's what caused the symptoms. We have a reason behind it. So we would recommend that she scale back and re-rest. I know that we are starting to run short on time. So um, briefly, we'll go over. There are several red flags, reasons you would definitely want to send her to the emergency room to get evaluated um, as are listed out here on our slide. Um, so those red flags were like we talked, the increasing headaches, vomiting, and the change in mood, the more irritability going on. Next slide. Um, I think we kind of touched on this, you know, when we're going to the ER, if we're worried that there's a more serious injury, there's a abnormality on their neuro exam that is focal um, or other concerns based on those PCARN criteria. And again, the emergency room and CAT scan should be used alone to diagnose the concussion. Next slide. So um, go we ahead. did have the second case. Um, I think we could run through this quickly and leave some time for the Q&A. Um, you agree? Everybody? <laughs> yeah, I think we can, I think you can go through quickly. All right, so John is a captain of the varsity soccer team. During a game yesterday, he went up for a header at the same time as another player and they hit heads. He noticed brief dizziness and blurry vision, but continued playing for 15 more minutes until the game ended. He went home, fell asleep earlier than usual. When he woke up in the morning, he had a frontal headache and dizziness. He went to school where his symptoms worsened and texted his parents to pick him up early. In the car, he then reported what happened in the game, and his parents brought him to the pediatrician for evaluation. At the pediatrician, his exam is normal except for a positive Romberg. So um, what would you recommend as next step for management? Um, we were going to open up the chat for you guys to kind of throw in there, but um, in the interest of time, we'll just move forward. And just noting that he, that he did have some sway on his Romberg. So essentially, and again, I think everybody's been answering correctly recently, right? So it, it is recommended that John should stay home with brain rest for 24 to 48 hours. And after that brief period of rest, John can return to school, potentially with that accommodations in place. And at this point, also the pediatrician recommends that he can have medication as needed for headache. And the thing I want to just mention here is there's a conversation always about should we be giving acetaminophen versus ibuprofen? And, you know, the real thought about not using ibuprofen is that, you know, um, if there is a concern for a bleed, that it could, you know, worsen bleed. But honestly, if you're not really thinking that there is a bleed and it's really, you know, just post-concussive headache, it is okay for them to take um, I ibuprofen. So the pediatrician reevaluates a week later and he's been doing well. So now we're going to jump into, you know, what can we recommend for the return to play guidelines? So this is a five step, um, a graduated five step return to play. So um, it's all separated by 24 hours. So the first uh, day light aerobic activity, you know, so go for a walk around the block. The next day, if he doesn't have any um, symptoms return, he can go for his jog or, you know, little you know, uh, more of a run. And again, if no um, symptom returned the next day, he can increase that activity. So sports specific drills um, without any contact. 
The fourth uh, step could be practice, yellow shirted, um, and then the following with full contact and then competition. So um, this, um, this is uh, part of the Department of Education's um, recommendations um, that they have for the um, uh, safety training program. And they, um, each school district must have a written policy concerning their prevention and treatment of sports related concussions and head injuries, and they must follow um, the return to play recommendations. So um, in order to be cleared for return to play, they need to have a normal neurologic um, exam. They need to be symptom free. I tell the patients, you know, this is an invisible injury. They're not sitting here, you know, limping or cast on. So they need to be honest um, that they, um, you know, don't have any more symptoms. Uh, we have to take into consideration the history, the length of recovery and those previous concussions. Um, I also go into uh, what kind of concussions that they had and how long they've had their symptoms um, after each concussion. But also, you know, let's say they fell off the swing when they were three and then they got a concussion when they were 10 playing soccer and another one when they were 15. You know, you have to take all that time frame into consideration as well. They need to be off medications. Um, I did see a question in the in the Q and A in terms of um, you know uh, if we can you know utilize the help of the athletic trainer. Absolutely, the athletic trainer um, can you know uh, complete these steps if there is an an athletic trainer. Um, sometimes um, I will have the physical therapist um, to uh, help provide with input as well. So, you know. There, there really is no red and green if there is loss of consciousness or loss of con yes or no of loss of consciousness, but typically, you know, one week if there's no loss of consciousness and at two weeks, you know, again, what other symptoms were going on along with those loss of consciousness? Um, you know, how long was the loss of consciousness? Um, you know, if there was a bleed or a contusion, um, you know, that's going to, uh, you know, increase um, the length of time um, for return to play. Um, and again, has fully returned to learn with no academic limitations. Yeah, I see um, a couple questions in here that I want to make sure we, we have I know, I'm trying to, to address. So um, one um, from school nurse that um, they see many patients that return the day after a concussion with notes from the doctor. Should they be encouraging that they rest? I would say it depends. Um, if they have very minimal symptoms and they're able to make it through the day, it's probably okay for them to be there the next day, but just keeping an eye on them, making sure that we're not seeing those symptoms get worse um, over time. If they are still very symptomatic, you know, they still have a constant headache that is you know, a five out of 10 or more, they're dizzy, they feel nauseous, they're tired, then yes, you should recommend that they miss school um, at least a day to try to rest and recover. Um, another one, uh, if a student, two students run into each other and bump their head, but one has a small bump, no other symptoms, do you need to keep them out of gym or recess on that day? Probably not, especially if, you know, the little bump you see is up in that frontal uh, area. But I would, again, keep a close eye on things. Um, certainly if you had the choice to do a lower risk activity, I mean, that would be preferred. Um, it's hard to make a blanket statement on that one. But most of the time, as long as they're asymptomatic and balance looks good, that should be okay. Um, someone asked about young kids or nonverbal autistic or other neurodivergent kids. How do you evaluate them? Basically the same way, um, doing the best you can within their abilities. So for our nonverbal kids, certainly it's going to be more challenging to assess their cognitive status and ask them, you know, to remember words or tell us the months of the year backwards. Um, but 
this is where we're really looking to families, to teachers, or if they have one-on-ones in school to tell us what are you noticing going on? So it's important to have that open dialogue between the medical team and the educational side of things. And I know Dr. Glixman and myself are always, always happy <laughs> to talk directly to school nurses, to teachers, administrators, anyone who has questions about um, what we should be doing to manage or to help manage our patients and have them be successful. The way that I also answered that is just, you know, um, not even just the autistic kids, but, you know, any younger child who can't speak yet is, you know, is there any change from their baseline mental status? And is there any change from their baseline motor exam? But a patient with hypotonia may take longer to recover if there, you know, if there was a concussion, just because they're already hypotonic and maybe a little unsteady to begin with. Um, they may definitely, you know, part, um, improve with more physical therapy. You know, they may have physical therapy for a different reason, but they may need to kind of change their goals in physical therapy for a little bit just based on a concussion symptom. Um, let's see what else. Julia DeBellis asks, why is the his, uh, um, Hispanic ethnicity associated with the poor prognosis? Um, that's a really interesting question. Um, I know this was all based um, you know, from the CDC and the, um, uh, the, the CDC studies. Um, and I don't know if that just was based on their population, um, but um, good question. I'd have to look into that answer. Um, and then a last one I think is important, right? School seems like a big factor. What do you do in the summertime when kids are still participating in sports? Um, that is always a little more challenging. I would say that in the summertime, it's even more important to make sure you have some kind of neurocognitive assessment that is being utilized, whether it's neuropsychology doing testing, um, impact testing, there are some other baseline tests that are out there that are sometimes utilized at the schools that do have a cognitive component as well, like the sway. Um, so I would make sure that we have something. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. Yeah, I'm just sure. trying to make sure. Uh, to clarify, should patients should be symptom free before even starting return to play protocol? not necessarily um, entirely symptom free. It's just that the symptoms need to be relatively mild and that the physical activity isn't exacerbating those factors. Um, and you may take a bit of a slower progression just depending on things. So the last, um two slides, sorry, was again, just to show you the um, different various forms that are available on the CDC website for coaches, for parents, for, for um, um, healthcare professionals, for nurses, so you can download everything and, and there, it's all for free. Um, and just um, some information, the Brain, the Brain Injury Alliance of New Jersey is also a good, good resource um, as well for fact sheets. And um, in the interest of time, uh, uh, this is our contact information. If, again, if you guys want to send patients our way or to, um, you know, speak to us, we're, we're always reachable. Um, there was a question in the chat I did just want to address was, you know, what's the best time? I think there was an ED, an ED a physician of, you know, what's, when's the best time to, to refer? Um, there's always, you could always refer, um, you know, uh, depending on the situation, obviously, they should always uh, follow up with their pediatrician, um, as well as, you know, referral to concussion center, to a neurologist. I just always worry personally, and I know um, me and Dr. Mark Antuano have talked about this before is, you know, we have a patient who waited like a week to see us or even two weeks to see us. And they've been out of school because they were told no school until seen by somebody. Right. And so I think that's really it's it, why it's important. Like the pediatrician, that the kid may feel better by the next day and can go back to school. But if they're not, then they can definitely, you know, be should, should be seen by a specialist as well.
I, I like this one. I have a student that's had five concussions and was taken out of contact sports for the rest of school life. Will that ever be lifted or is that for life? Um, so the risk of re-injury doesn't really change over time. Each time you have a concussion, that risk does continue to um, go up. And some of that, again, with multiple concussions, some of it is certainly a judgment call. Um, if a child had, you know, three concussions, but they were all extremely mild, um, they were symptom free by 10 days post injury, and they were able to progress back to the return to play by three weeks post injury or four weeks post injury, that may look uh, like a different conversation than a child who has had, we'll say the same number, three concussions, but took uh, nine months to recover from the first one, a year to recover from the second one, and six months from the third one, and they all happened playing football, that's going to be a different conversation that we have. Like that one, we probably would say that contact sports are not a good idea when we talk about risk benefits. Yeah. So uh, Dr. Marcantuno and Dr. Glixman, being at time, I just want to take a moment to thank you both so much for speaking today and giving the education on this really important topic to so many different um, providers and experts who work with patients. Um, you can continue to say, share your screen, Dr. Glixman and Dr. Marcantuno. I just oh. want to let folks know if they need to head off now, that's totally fine. And we could, if you have the time to answer a few more questions, I know there's a few more Q and A. So feel free to reshare your screen, Dr. Clickman, in case people want to grab your contact information. Um, what would you re What would you recommend for kids, adolescents who do not have an athletic trainer to guide return to play? Do they follow up with the PMD weekly to guide level of play? Um, not necessarily. Some of that. You know, I typically give kids the return to play uh, protocols, at least the non-contact stages. I let them progress that on their own and talk about how to do that. Um, I also have some like sports specific ones that I utilize depending on what the child is participating in. But certainly before they are going to those non, I'm sorry, those contact stages of return to play, they need to be feeling 100% back to full baseline school performance. They need to have a completely normal exam, including uh, balance and the uh, VOMS testing as well. So, you know, if you're a primary care doctor and you're talking about managing that um, on your own without a specialist, please make sure you check those other um, assessments as well, because I have seen patients in my clinic who have gone back too soon um, and have very clear abnormalities on their visual tracking uh, on exam. So that can not only slow recovery, but put them at risk for more severe uh, brain injuries as well as orthopedic injuries as well. So I also like to tell patients that, you know, there's no hard, fast, you're going to get better in this time and you're going to feel better here and this is what you're going to do. Um, it's an art. And, you know, um, there, there was a question of, you know, what if the patient's symptoms continue after two days of period? Do you keep them out of school longer? You worry about a student playing up symptoms to avoid school. Mm -hmm. So, you know, again, it's an art. You know your patient well. But the other thing is, you know, um, you know studies have shown that keeping them out longer from school, they tend to have the longer recovery, whether it's because that social integration is just important for mood as well. Um, but also the fact that, um, that, you know, at least they can understand what's going on a little bit at school and not miss things in audit. So um, I'm actually um, a, a firm believer as, as even just treating headaches and chronic headaches is that I don't provide blanket letters that if, please excuse if they have a headache, they need to call and let me know, right? But 
what time of day are you getting your headaches, right? And so if they, the patient needs to sleep in and waking up is really kind of causing them to get headaches, let them sleep in and let them go to school from 10 to two, right? So maybe just do half days for a little bit with auditing, um, no homework, no tasks. So, you know, that's the really important thing of, of, you know, as I say, we're all part of the team and speaking with the school and, and you know, uh, really trying to get them into school as much as possible in order to avoid falling behind and again, and then getting stressed over trying to catch up. So, um, you know, everybody's going to be a little bit different, but um, I've had to dig out patients who have been homeschooled for four months. And I know that this is going to be a chore to get them back because four months of being homeschooled, something's going on on a psychological level that they can't go back to school. Like there's something else going on. Um, and then that kind of goes in um, to what Kate Backer was saying is that as of August, 2023, it's a six step return to play. Yes, step one, they added return to school. So I think that that was um, a, a nice, important addition. Um, just putting into print of the return to learn before return to play is a very important step. So thank you for sharing that. Um, we answered that, we answered that. What about a case of adolescent who has some behavior, mental health, substance use pathology, like we might see in the juvenile justice setting? It's a very good question. I actually have a patient who, um, Vaping and vaping marijuana was a very big, big, big um, problem with underlying um, oppositional defiance uh, disorder. Um, and it actually took a lot, a lot of, um, you know, um, interdisciplinary uh, participation with between me and the psychiatrist and really interplaying, you know, what's causing what. Um, and actually really getting him into a smoking sensation program was really important also. And, um, you know, again, there's so many different underlying things that, that are causing worsening symptoms is to really try to pick the one that's, that's really affecting him the most. And that's really the approach that we had to, that we had to take with him that for him, it was the, um, the, the marijuana, but also it, it, he actually did have nicotine as well. And then he, he, um, he came out that he was just smoking so, so much. So we actually got him into rehab for that. And then eventually everything else started to kind of get better. So, um, you know, picking that battles this time is, is really tough. If a child bumps into other students or something in the classroom and has a small bump and no symptoms, it is recommended that the student doesn't participate in recess on that day. I, you know, that that's that's a vague, you know, there's not going to be the best answer, right? If you if, if they're in the school setting, um, the school is probably going to just sit them out and just call the parent just to sit them out and make sure that that they're OK for the day, you know. I would say in a, in a school setting, um, from a nursing standpoint, it's better to err on the side of caution. But if the kid is completely fine, otherwise, I wouldn't call that a concussion. Um, do we yes. have a step? I'm sorry, Dr. Glixman. Do we have a stepwise approach to return to school to give families? Um, some schools do well with vague guidance, but others need more specifics. Like, yes, we we do have some and. Um, certainly, I would check also the CDC heads up uh, website for some of that information uh, as well. But we try to get very specific uh, things and how we progress. Um, and currently down here at, at Jersey Shore through our concussion program, I don't know if Dr. Glitzman, you may already have it, but we're working on just some uh, information for like concussion in the classroom and providing uh, the teachers and school nurses just like more information on how to manage that and why we do what we do uh, as far as the accommodations go. Mm -hmm. So somebody wanted me, sorry, in the in the chat, I think this is the same person because it's coming up as anonymous. Um, this messaging is so different than years ago when my son concussed frequently as a snowboarder and we were told not to let him rest and to get him back on the snow immediately. He died at the age of 30, but I often wonder 
how the field got this so wrong back then. You know, I think the answer to this really has evolved out of coming out of the, you know, National, you know, Football League, um, um, all of their um, research that's been going on on the NFL player players' brains and, you know, mm-hmm. um, uh, seeing the effects of uh, chronic traumatic encephalopathy. I know we didn't talk about that today because that's a whole other, um, you know, ball game. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, it's, they going back to the NFL players, they really saw that, you know, they weren't being upfront with their um, head injuries. They, um, you know, they were, you know, shaking it off and getting back to play. It was not cool to sit out because you didn't feel good. And so, um, you know, going back and interviewing those that they could, um, you know, really showed that um, just the increased number of, of hits even subconcussive hits um, with the linebackers um, really have increased the risks of mood disorders, Alzheimer's, Parkinsonism, epilepsy in the older population. And so, you know, starting younger um, with proper um, uh, with proper um, practices and decreasing the amount of headers at certain ages and, you know, how many you can do in, in um, um, younger age groups and in practice versus play is really trying to prevent um, the uh, chronic traumatic encephalopathy and um, mm-hmm. the neurological disorders that they were seeing in those patients. So I think that that's why there's that all been that change has really just been because of so much focus on the NFL. Yeah, I think a big thing just to add there is that um, I don't know how many years ago we're we're referring to here that this happened, but um, we know that, you know, 30, 40 years ago, people didn't really care about concussions. We didn't really realize that they were causing injuries to the brain, right? You kind of still hear the terms like, oh, it's not a concussion. You just got your bell rung. Um, but we know that that is actually a concussion. Um, and some of it would be um, older advice, right? If your child has a concussion, don't let them go to sleep um, because if there is a slow epidural bleed going on, you may miss that. They may sleep through those presenting symptoms. Um, so perhaps this was where some of the uh, information about don't rest um, came from. But um, I don't know, you know, about sending them back to sport um, because that seems to be more in the past, like prior to the last 20 years or so. So thank you for that. We had one more question. So I thought this will be our last question in the chat. It snuck in, not, not in the Q&A, on the, on the chat from April, which said, with any hit to the head, is it necessary to use the SCAT 6 or is it a judgment call? And then I already to- answered oh, that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Then, then we're solid. If there's any other closing <laughs> notes that you guys would like to say at this point, let me know. No, I think just in closing, I just wanted to thank everyone again um, for being here for our talk today. We are definitely available if you have any students or patients that you think um, need a specialist, please reach out to us. We're more than happy to see them. If any other questions um, come up or if you're interested in having any more talks for your office or schools, definitely let our team here know and we can try to make some arrangements for that. Yeah, no, thank you so much for for staying on this long. We really appreciate the enthusiasm. (laughs) Thanks, everyone. The recording will be sent out after today's presentation, and I appreciate everyone joining. So thank you again to our speakers and our attendees. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.